they often will respond, well, when you see Lazarus, right, they, that's often the depiction. They say, well, when we're talking about dead, we're saying that, no, they are dead in the tomb like Lazarus was. And Jesus declared for Lazarus to stand up and come out. But we're not talking about that type of dead, right? Just for clarification, we're not talking about the uh, literal man that cannot do anything. He's dead in the tomb. And, and like you were talking about that conversation with Cy, uh, mm-hmm. Ten Brugentate, he said that we were, we were, um, he, he used a vulgar term, but he, yeah. he basically said shark poop. Like we're dead at the bottom of the ocean and it takes that regeneration. That's why they'll really push mm-hmm. regeneration right. preceding faith. Right. The first thing you want to do is get them off of insisting on using English words when we're talking about theology that's derived from biblical exegesis Mm -hmm. and go back to the original text and say, okay, now, we know that there is no such thing as one-for-one correspondence between one language and another. We also know that in all languages, Words mean different things in different contexts. So let's start there. And it comes, it's an issue of methodology. Mm. How do we go about dealing with the meaning of these terms, which is a field of study called lexicography, which is mm. what you end up with in the dictionary. Okay. And uh, so I think that we want to push back a little bit harder and say, no, we're not talking about the English term dead. Mm. Okay. But To answer your question, right here in Genesis chapter 2, it tells us that the meaning of the term, at least one meaning of the term, is alienation. Or you may have heard separation. Mm -hmm. But clearly, Adam and Eve were alienated from God's fellowship. They were alienated from God's presence when they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, and they were alienated from God's life. Mm -hmm. So right in the very beginning of the scriptures, we have this concept that one broad field of meaning of the terms that we're addressing or looking at is the concept of being alienated from God's presence, his fellowship, and his life. Mm -hmm. Okay, Right there out of Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 3. You come back now to the text in Ephesians, and we've already touched on the fact that the book of Ephesians chapter 2 is talking about a positional truth. Mm -hmm. That is, we are alienated from the presence of God because we do not have access to the covenant community. Uh, That's Ephesians 2 verses 11 and 12. It was they, the Jews, that had access to God through the sacrificial system, through temple worship. So the Gentiles to whom Paul writes in Ephesus, they don't have access to the presence of God. They don't have access to the fellowship of God because they are aliens and strangers to the covenants. Mm -hmm. And what they're stuck with is living with all of the fallout that comes from people that are li- that are uh, alienated from God's presence, God's power, God's life. Mm-hmm. That's what death in this text means. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we see that uh, consistent as we read from Genesis to Revelation. We see the position that man in general stands before God mm-hmm. and the reactions to him, the hostility, but there's still reactions and um, and and God constantly pursuing the heart of the rebel, mm-hmm. which uh, why would he pursue them? You know, that's a whole nother conversation. But for, for a little bit of shaking up, because I, I don't want us to just feel like we're just uh, not leaving the cards on the table for, for the other party. They often will respond, well, when you see Lazarus, right? They, that's often the depiction. They say, well, when we're talking about dead, we're saying that, no, they are dead in the tomb like Lazarus was. And Jesus declared for Lazarus to stand up and come out. But we're not talking about that type of dead, right? Just for clarification. We're not talking about the uh, literal man that cannot do anything. He's dead in the tomb. And, and like you were talking about that conversation with Cy, uh, mm-hmm. Ten Brugentate, he said that we were, 
we were, um, he, he used a vulgar term, but he, yeah. he basically said shark poop. Like we're dead at the bottom of the ocean and it takes that regeneration. That's why they'll really push mm -hmm. regeneration right. preceding faith. Right. Well, um, it's nice if you get to define your own terms. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. And, and again, that, that, it's a, as I said at the beginning, it always comes back to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, they don't get to define their terms. Right. The if scriptures you, do. If you let them do that, they go crazy. Yeah. I mean, you go to John 3.16, and anybody in the first century that in Koine Greek would have uh, seen the term cosmos, would have understand... Uh, would have understood a system, an organization. I mean, it's where the, the term cosmology comes from. Um, even the word cosmetics, which is part of bringing order to chaos in the morning. <laughs> the, but um, the idea that it refers to the world, they do not allow that. It's only the elect. And You're yet right, that, right. that would have never occurred to anybody no, that that read and understood the language. That was not a definition that was in circulation mm. uh, in, until the four, uh, 16th century. Right. So, yeah, they can play all they want with the Lazarus thing, but there's another another Lazarus story in the Bible that that we oftentimes overlook, and that's the parable of Lazarus right. and the rich man. Rich man, yeah. And what do we see Lazarus in this parable doing? He's separated by this. A vast gulf that's unbridgeable between um, uh, Lazarus and the rich man, and the rich man mm -hmm. sees what's going on, and he responds to God yeah. and asks, "Will you send somebody to speak to my brother?" So, was the rich man who uh, in this life? Mm -hmm was spiritually dead was he regenerated when he died so that right. he could then understand and see what's going on and have a heart of compassion for his brother yeah the whole thing is absurd so right. yep. so when they bring up lazarus in the tomb say well yep let's talk about another another lazarus yep that's right and that pulls the rug right out from under because they they think that the conscience is so seared that it can't respond to god except, except in hostility but we see lazarus and the rich man we see Matt, the rich man say father abraham you know please dip your finger he, he's in torment right that's mm -hmm. the the conversation you're talking about but then if so could you please send someone to tell my family right so also has compassion right to see the others saved mm -hmm. and and i would say that a calvinist would really struggle with that response wouldn't you yeah and then to go even a little bit added to that uh, abraham didn't correct him and say well maybe some of them might be predestined again that's a different topic but you know, that he wanted all of them to be saved. Even mm -hmm. the unregenerated dead man wanted all of his brothers to be saved. How That's ironic right. is that? Mm -hmm. You know, and you go, hmm. So the unregenerated dead man has more love for his brothers than God does? Right. You talk about some Calvinists. Yeah. So you go, okay, well, the inconsistencies. And the idea of the the deadness to me and the idea of man being dead, you know, just then filters to every other. You have to hold on to that. You have to hold that piece of the puzzle in order for anything else in tulip, you know, total depravity and the, uh, is obviously there. That's what they define it as, total deadness, total inability is really what we're saying. Yep. But if you're going to use the Lazarus example, the Lazarus in the tomb, dead, yep. uh, the problem is a physical dead body. First of all, that wasn't Lazarus. That was a body. Lazarus was somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that tells me immediately that it's more of an issue of walking by sight than a walking by faith when they examine it that That's way because point. we're looking at the body of Lazarus. It's not Lazarus yeah. any more than, you know, when I die, my body will be somewhere, but that's not me. Mm -hmm. That's part of me, but that's not me. Yeah. And so, but if you're going to take that angle, he couldn't, he couldn't do anything. He couldn't reject. He couldn't accept. There's nothing there. Mm -hmm. So it falls just from the logic itself, it falls short. And then from the Bible, it falls short. The inconsistencies, it falls short. And, you know, you even have many Calvinists arguing over what exactly they believe and what they actually mean by all these things because it all falls short. And if we're really supposed to uh, have a God who is a God of order, not a God of disorder, mm. and a God of love, then I would think that these things shouldn't be so problematic or cause so much division. 
one one last pin to drop in the uh, Lazarus question mm-hmm. for the for the sake of your audience. Cause mm-hmm. I'm sure you guys already know this, but theologians point out that um, a human life is the um, merger. It's a combination of a living rational spirit and a physical body. Right. Death is the separation or the alienation of those two, a destruction of that relationship. Mm. So even um, when we think about dead bodies, we have to recognize there is a spirit that has been taken away. Right. So, And that's ultimately what death is. Death, by very definition, isn't the inanimate body laying there. We see that part of it, so we see the evidence of death. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in a body that's no longer functioning, in a heart that's no longer pumping, a brain that's no longer working. That's the evidence of death, but that's not death. Yeah, Death is the act of separation between the two. Yeah. 